Hello, my name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on governmental bureaucracy. So let's make a governmental bureaucracy. How much power should it have? The power to rule businesses in the case of state capitalism? Or maybe we should limit the power in the case of constitutionalism. What language will we speak? Well, of course, the language of money is that even a question. So our government will have a token economy. Because token economies are just economies with generalized reinforcers with no inherent value like coins or bills. Do you think our government should be involved in business or largely absent? If you said stay out of business, then you prescribe to laissez-faire, the policy where the government does not interfere with business. The laissez-faire is present in capitalism, which involves the government staying out of business. Capitalism is contrasted with state capitalism, involving the economic center, ruled by, to no surprise, the state in state capitalism. Now, we need to ask ourselves, should laissez-faire also include welfare? Should our government care for the welfare of our poor citizens or leave it to the economic system to decide? Well, in the United States, there is a minimum wage law, equal pay acts, etc. This is called welfare capitalism, which involves the government meddling in economics, but only at the welfare level, which most people would probably agree is a good thing. In the case of the United States, we use Medicare and Medicaid, amongst other regulations. The mnemonic from Khan Academy is using the last letter. The E in Medicare is for the elderly, whereas the D in Medicaid is for the destitute, another word for poor. Now, let's talk about the poor. We don't like it. We don't want it. So let's prevent it. Let's do so by primary prevention, which attempts to stop poverty before it occurs. Primary prevention acts to circumvent poverty by stopping job and home loss. Well, if there's a primary prevention, there would have to be a secondary prevention, right? Secondary prevention just tries to stop poverty at an early age, like of orphan children. And tertiary prevention, the last one, uses methods after the fact, like providing permanent housing for the homeless. These are low yield, though, so don't worry if you didn't catch them all. There are two types of poverty, primary and secondary poverty. The first, primary, lacks human needs like food and shelter, whereas those in secondary poverty have income that is above the poverty line but spend most of their money on frivolous things causing their poverty. So would primary or secondary poverty correspond to absolute or relative poverty? The first, primary poverty, would be in absolute poverty because they absolutely lack the capital whereas secondary poverty would more so be a relative poverty because those in relative poverty are only poor in comparison to others around them, like a millionaire surrounded by many billionaires. While it may be impossible to completely prevent the poor in our governmental system, we must understand that they have a unique culture and thus play some sort of role. So Oscar Lewis called this the culture of poverty. He argues there is a way of life handed on from generation to generation among family lines. This style of life transcends rural-urban differences within nations. Wherever it occurs, its practitioners exhibit similarity and structure of their families, relations, and value systems. Interestingly, but like all great governments, let's weed out the old and make way for the new. Let's revamp those lively cultures with our richer ones. A process dubbed gentrification, revamping poor areas to fit the norms. This mode of thinking, basing social and political institutions off of the material forces, falls under Marx's materialistic concept of history. The gentrification of these processes could be another means of production by which the economics can thrive. But hey people, it's survival of the fittest, as the social Darwinist Herbert Spencer would say. Spencer argued that groups and even cultures, like the culture of poverty, are subjected to the same survival game that species are. Thus, social Darwinism. In order to thrive, these groups need some type of capital. Any ideas what these capitals might be? Well, as Perret Bordeaux would argue, there are three types of capital which are necessary for societal success. Those are economic capital, which is just what assets or cash you have, social capital, which is just the relationships and networks that you're a part of, or, you know, the social connections. And lastly, 
cultural capital, which is the skills and education useful in your society. So we've so far decided that our government is a token economy, uses laissez-faire, yet incorporates welfare capitalism, use multiple prevention mechanisms to try to eliminate absolute and possibly relative poverty, and lastly, we understand that to do all this, we need to help the culture of poverty attain these economic, cultural, and social capitals to rise to the middle class standards. Great, our government rocks. We hit it big, now we start to modernize, as in modernization theory. Modernization theory says that all countries take a similar path towards modernization. And remember, the more we modernize, as the secularization thesis would claim, the less religion matters. And finally, let's globalize, as in globalization via enhancing our relationships with other powerful countries. There are three perspectives for how globalization occurs. First is the hyperglobalist perspective, which argues for hypertrophy of capitalism, thus a hypertrophy of economics. Hyperglobalists would say, Increases in economic power reduce the power of governments, and this could be good or bad for small countries. The skeptic perspective argues globalization happens, but the third world countries get screwed. Skeptic, screwed? Skeptics say they get screwed because the benefits are not necessarily increasing economic value, but really just national governments maintaining or gaining power. Lastly, the transformationalist perspective. The transformationalist perspective says, whoa, 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 transformation is happening, but not by a single economic cause. And we can't really say if someone's getting screwed or not. So the transformational perspective is more open, so to speak. So we modernize, we lost religion based on secularization thesis, we globalize, we choose the perspective. Whoa, look what's happening. We've been demographically and numerically developing we're going to have to start instigating some preventative checks to help limit the population. But first, we need to understand country development. According to world systems theory, we have three types of countries. You've got your makers, like China, who make all your stuff. You've got your posters, who post their troops all over the entire globe, like the United States. And I'm just kidding. Countries and world systems theory are simple. There's core, peripheral, and semi-peripheral countries. The core countries are dominant globally and revolve around economics or capitalism. They exploit the peripheral countries for cheap labor and materials like sweatshops and obtaining oil. Your semi-peripheral countries are just a combination of the two. In opposition to the world systems theory, dependency theory states that peripheral countries are dependent on the core countries via loans and debt. But ironically, when core countries get wealthier, the peripheral countries do not necessarily experience the same trends. So what does this inequality lead to? Well, global stratification. Next, let's discuss the development of these countries as outlined by Warren Thompson's demographic transition model. He noticed a general trend in the birth and death rates. As countries reached a pinnacle point in their development, death rates began declining. So at first, you have stage one, which involves a population pyramid with a wide base, representing high birth rates on the bottom, and the thin top is revealing high death rates. In stage two, the death rates begin declining, like I mentioned, and the population pyramid starts to resemble a triangle. Afterward, the birth rates start declining even more so, and the population pyramid begins to look more so like a square or a trapezoid in stage three. Soon, birth rates decrease even further due to changes in ideals and contraceptives and medicine that decreases the death rates. Thus, stage four begins to look more like an inverted triangle. Stage five is unknown, but in Thompson's demographic transition model, it speculates there may be a decrease in population due to a reduced land and resource availability. But this is only speculation. Please note that this doesn't take into account the push and pull factors of migration. Push factors are those causing people to leave or emigrate. Pull factors are those causing people to come, so immigrate. Many other immigration factors are at play, but sometimes people will be refugees who emigrate seeking asylum from another country. But Let's stop and pay homage to the first person to develop the systematic theory of population around the 1800s. Thomas Malthus. 
developed the Malthusian theory of population. He argues food production increases linearly, while the population increases exponentially. So what's the problem? What do you think is going to happen? Well, we would eventually run out of food to feed everyone because we have more people than we have food. To remember Malthus's theory, I think when math happens, death happens. Malthus, math, hopefully that helps. Well, hey, how can we stop this? Malthus recommended making preventative checks, aka institute some practices to limit reproduction. But if our preventative checks hadn't worked, we're going to have to institute some positive checks. Basically, we need to start slothing people off. Positive checks could be war, famine, or even genocide, which is killing of one distinct group. That was a lot of terms for this episode, so make sure you go back and look them over. And that's the end of this episode.